Hello and welcome to the Synergia People Podcast 2023. My name is Bill Dempster. I've acquired the nickname Freddie. I've um, been with the Synergia Projects. Also, uh, there's an organization called Institute of Ecotechnics, uh, which is one aspect of our multiple organization endeavors since 1969. Wow, that's quite a long time. What did you do before? You joined the crowd. Uh, before that, I was working as a computer systems programmer at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory at the University of California. That was from 1964 to 69. And before that, I had just graduated from the University of California in mathematics and physics. What brought you to this crowd, which later became the synergists? I met them in San Francisco in 1968. It seemed that they were doing some very interesting things, although not much was planned in advance at that point. There were many ideas uh, talked about history and this and the kinds of civilizations that had existed in the world for uh, centuries, even thousands of years, what sort of trajectory civilizations have, and uh, how they're influenced by the things that individual people do or or small groups do. And, uh, there was definitely an interest in creating a group that would do creative projects, uh, particularly in relationship to the ecological aspects of the planet. That was relatively early, but nevertheless, it was recognized that there were serious ecological issues with the way right. humanity was developing and the impacts that it had on the planet. Yeah, so you joined the group in San Francisco in 69, then you moved over here? Well, not exactly, to... because there was a little interlude. The group went from San Francisco to New York, in part to do some theater, because theater was also a major component of the work, which is interesting because theater not just for entertainment, but theater because it gives a lot of insight to the dynamics of human interactions and motives and purposes and large-scale organizations. And the play that we did in New York was Oedipus. And Oedipus is also a figure of prominence in the history of the world. How did you see your place within this group? And how did this develop over... 60 years. <laughs> well, I didn't see a place particularly uh, or envision that I had a role or so on. I was more interested just simply in participating and having uh, the experiences and, uh, and doing, participating in things that were being done uh, just because they were, they were very interesting. And so it wasn't as if I envisioned a role for myself. But of course, when one does that, one develops a role more or less inevitably just because a person is whoever they are. I mean, it's one thing to join a group, you know, to get started, but then to stay with this over the course of so, so many decades. <laughs> What kept you going? What kept you committed to this idea? Well, the uh, projects that were being undertaken were very interesting and challenging and um, seemed to have a place in the world. So that's the first thing. Of course, I understand that it's commonplace for people in society today to think of things like a career in terms of money they may make or if it fits with their training. But this was not like that. 
there was not a, a big offer of money or a significant offer of money. It was more like, um, can we do this, whatever the next project is? You mentioned earlier, these days in San Francisco, when you first came together, was a very special time. Do you think forming a group like you did and working on interesting projects, challenging projects over such a long time. Is this still possible today? It's hard for me to judge. I, I don't know. I don't have the perspective of what the larger society situations and opportunities are today. So I don't think I can really answer that. Looking back, what were the most interesting projects or the most challenging things you have done? Well, they came one at a time. I mean, for the moment after San Francisco was New York, actually the first time that I had ever been out of California. And I had a car and I drove all the way across the country to New York. from Which was an experience on its own. Yes, that was very eye-opening because there are a lot of different cultures in within the United States, very different. Yes. And I drove all the way across the country and uh, and you could see these differences, which was new to me because I had been born and raised in Berkeley, which was, of course, a university town, and gone to the University of California in Berkeley. So I was very much already conditioned and established, so to speak, yeah. in, in that. And I had very little idea about how many differences there were across the country. But then you reached New York. And coming back to my question, when you look back, if you have to choose two, three significant things which happened to you during this time, what would they be? Well, the main thing was that we were all working very hard um, because to organize, to prepare for doing this performance from scratch, you know, right. from brand new. Yeah. Uh, which takes a lot of work to get that comprehension. And then as you moved on? I, in particular, went back to Berkeley and went back to my job at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory yeah. in Computer Systems. I was very fortunate that I was given a leave to... To explore these to, things. To do this for yeah. like three months and yeah. still be able to return to the job. Marie in the meantime, had been given the task by John to find a property somewhere in the Southwest where the organization could acquire some property to start an intentional community. Marie found this property, Synergy Ranch, which was up for sale, and it was a large property, 165 acres. It had been originally created as a ranch back in the 1920s as what's called a homestead in the United States. Yeah. It was within our economic means to purchase. But of course, once again, there was an enormous amount of work, work. to be done. Where was, does this commitment come from? It, there must be a deep inner voice telling you, you better well, go. It's because there was great visions of achieving something for Synergia Ranch to become a intentional community, but also a uh, ecologically based production center for gardens and even possibly livestock and so on, based on non-destructive ecological practices. How would you describe the values going along with it when you found it, the ranch here? Well, I would say basically the vision of achieving things like that, that were outlined as a project with an objective, not as a project to make money. Okay. This was the essential difference in my mind is that it was a project to achieve something that had significance as opposed to doing something as a way to make money. What else came along the way? One aspect of the ecology is to have a view and an understanding of the entire planet. That would include humanity's place in the planet and the effects that humanity has on the planet. And to understand the planet ecologically as an ecosystem 
We didn't use the term at that time, but even though it was the foundations of the idea of biosphere, one of the aspects of that is, well, we call this planet Earth, but in fact, 70% of it is it's water. water. It's the oceans. Why isn't it called planet water? The point is that if we really want to understand this planet, we should understand the oceans. And so the idea then became to build a ship, not just a ship to go from one place to another or to carry some cargo from one place to another, but a ship that would enable people to live on the ocean. And explore it, really. And explore it and to develop understanding about it. Yeah. And of course, there is a long tradition of people, which we refer to as sea people, who either live on the edge of the ocean, on the land near the ocean, or they may even live on the ocean in terms of having vessels that go right. out and spend long periods of time uh, on the ocean. And this project, again, brought you back to Oakland. Um, it wouldn't really do to build a ship here in the middle of the desert. So you build it way on, to go. on the edge of the water. And so we went back to San Francisco Bay. And of course, in this particular case, it was Oakland, yes. Yeah. So you built the ship where I talked um, quite extensively with Christine. Right. We we built the ship on the waterfront in Oakland at the bottom of Fifth Avenue. So what was your first trip on this boat? We talked about going to Hawaii, but that was a little too daunting as an initial voyage. So we changed plans and decided to go down the western coast of California. Then uh, I came back for a period of time here to the ranch. The voyage continued to all the way down Mexico through the Panama Canal and uh, over to the Caribbean. There was always someone at the ranch, so there was a yeah. back and forth going. So the ranch yeah. project did not stop. No, the ranch didn't stop. Yeah. How much time did you spend on the boat? Altogether, I've sailed about 20,000 miles. It's quite a lot. On the on the Heraclitus, the name of it is Heraclitus. How would you describe the feeling? I mean, you built such. A, it's not a small boat; it's a big boat. Right. You built this, you release it into the water. How would you describe your feeling that wow, this boat is really sailing? <laughs> well, I guess uh, it's obviously an achievement. It's a relief to have it in the water and. I was mainly focused on the things that we had to do. Since that's not an end point right then and there, I I don't know if I can recall specifically um, the feelings yeah. of, of that as an event. I mean, clearly it was an event, but it's not like it was so remarkable just because it was a waypoint in a bigger picture. What other pieces of the puzzle did you add over then? This was in the 70s? This was 1974 to 75 that yeah. we, we built the ship. So we were looking also for the idea to build yet another intentional community with an agriculture or ecological basis Uh, in France, and we looked in that region around Marseille, and we found a, pr a place which we also acquired and uh, started then a small community there. Same principles, same, same ideas. Principle, same idea. From what I know, the biggest project, at least financially, was probably Biosphere 2. Yeah. This came, This came in, in came, the 80s, right? Uh, yes, this came in the 80s. Biosphere is almost certainly not unique in the universe, this biosphere. The universe is so vast, most people hardly ever conceive of how vast the universe is. It's um, very likely that there are other places in the universe where there is life. In other words, there are other biospheres. So biospheres are a 
entity that is very interesting. We have our particular biosphere, but who knows if other biospheres are nearly the same, maybe yeah. radically different, it's etc. Well, how could you begin to study biospheres? Well, the straightforward answer to that is build one. Build one and operate it and see what you find out. So as this idea evolved among ourselves, begin to think what will be included in this biosphere and what are its essential properties? Well, in order to be a biosphere that you build, of course, you have to seal it. You have to make it airtight. We live in a reciprocal relationship with all the plants. That is, plants grow and they provide food for us. Mm. But not so many people think about the fact that as the plants grow, they provide the oxygen that we breathe. breathe yeah. And furthermore, they absorb the carbon dioxide that we exhale. And so you rebuilt a biosphere in an airtight system. Right. Why does it need to be airtight? Well, okay, if you don't make it airtight, just have a greenhouse and grow a garden. The central question is recycling of the materials. That's what happens on planet Earth. All the life materials, the you know, vegetable matter that grows and the breath that we have, the food that we eat, the wastes that we give out, which of course provide nutrients for plants to grow. Animals. So your challenge was to rebuild all these cycles within this airtight dome. Right, right. But of course, we're not going to rebuild those cycles themselves. We only do so by drawing from the plants that grow on the planet and putting in animals, which include human beings in our case. And we're trying to enclose those in an airtight enclosure so that all of these cycles will be exemplified. And, uh, but within the, con within the containment yeah. that we call it biosphere two. What um, were the major learnings you have drawn out of this project? Okay, well, the fundamental idea is we don't know how to do that, to do this in advance although we can take an educated guess, okay? And the educated guess is to put a wide array of the life forms that we see around us on planet Earth together and make estimates. But these are nevertheless estimates. So to put them into this enclosure and keep it sealed, and then to find out how well did we do, and then depending on what we find out, with the idea to make changes as indicated by what we what happens, restart, so to speak, but not really restart completely, but make adjust, changes adjust. and see if we can adjust yeah. to get the cycles in dynamic balance. So it was basically an open process with feedback loops then built in and make it Better and better and better. Uh, we observed what happened. Right. And we, but I mean, we observed in very serious and organized ways. We have a lot of data sensors that are collecting all sorts of information like temperature and humidity and light. And, and I mentioned before also energetically open because we didn't presume that all these things would happen without the energy that's necessary for plants to grow, yeah. which comes from photosynthesis is, by yeah. sunlight. So what were your major learning out of this? A learning which so many people attacked the project for and tried to say that it was a failure for was to say that the oxygen level declined. For us, this was a straightforward expected type of learning experience because to have atmospheric balance, even though we understand the principles of recycling, yeah. to have the dynamic balance at the rate 
of conversion of carbon dioxide to oxygen would equal the rate of the re- respiration, the reverse yeah. conversion of oxygen to carbon dioxide, that those two rates would balance each other, of course, was highly unknown. So this was a major learning. Yeah. That's What a, else? A major learning. Well, of course, also carbon dioxide was high. That was that was a, a major learning. There were um, some species of ants that multiplied like crazy. Then, of course, another one was that uh, there were tensions among the crew because there were eight people who went inside for two years, I should point yeah. out, by yeah. the way, which is not a short period of time. It's <laughs> not like, okay, we're gonna going to go on for holiday. A, a day or a, or a week or anything like that. And there was a tendency for the group to split into two groups of four. So this was not entirely unexpected. Nevertheless, it was one of our learnings. What was your role in this project? title was Director of Systems Engineering. And the primary thing that I did was to be concerned about making it airtight. The important aspect that if you had a sealed system, that air, which is in the system, would expand and contract, obviously, with temperature. But if you think about it a, a little more carefully, what kind of pressure does this create on the enclosure? Temperature change inside, humidity change inside, and barometric pressure change outside, outside. and the momentary combination of those three factors will cause a different tendency for the enclosure to explode, oh, or it can be contraction of the gas volume inside and a tendency for the structure to implode, that is, be crushed. There had to be a way, a provision to allow for the relative expansion or contraction of the volume of atmosphere inside. And then we decided to build two lungs so that, for instance, if there was some problem or failure or technical problem with one lung, we would at least have the other lung to operate with while repair the other one yeah. being made. Basically, we built a tank with a tunnel connecting the tank to uh, uh, the main biosphere, <clears throat> two, two tunnels, two tanks. Yeah. The tank was a cylindrical tank with an open top, but over the top, we put a flexible membrane so the membrane could go, go up and down. Yeah. And by going up and down, it allowed for the volume or the expansion, contraction of the air volume of the entire system. If air in the biosphere wants to expand, the air can flow through the tunnel into the bottom of the tank, yeah. under the membrane. The membrane can rise up and absorb the volume. Yeah. And then if the reverse happens, the membrane can collapse and the air from the expansion chamber will go back through the tunnel into the biosphere. What did you as a crew take away from this? Well, it's important to also understand the entire project, um, even though the first mission, so to speak, with a crew of eight people was for two years, that was not the vision of the project. The vision of the project was for it to operate for a hundred years. years. And for it to continue to operate and for all the observations and even with modifications that we would make and so on and so forth, this would be a century worth of learning. Of course, that goes beyond our own lives, which is fine. And I might comment, people should think in terms like this if we're to be stewards of this planet. And of course, this is one of the ideas of Biosphere 2, that this would be a very big development in understanding if we could, in a system that is at a scale which we can look at in one view, so to speak, 
and understand all the data about how it operates and in what ways it's not ideal or it's out of balance. We should understand how a biosphere works. And we, and we call it, we creating a new science and we gave it a name, biospherics, sure. just like physics yeah. is a science. Biospherics is a science. Even though Biosphere 2 is not operated today like it was originally conceived and built, nevertheless, it is still very valuable because it is very important that we do work to study what goes on in ecological systems. This is, in fact, still going on, not in the manner that we intended, not in the manner that we built, but nevertheless, the fact that it's going on and the fact that it is in public view is very important. Today, Biosphere 2 is part of a university, right? University of Arizona. You're going back next week. I'm going back next week. And you haven't been back for? 30 years, almost. How do you feel going back after 30 years? Well, it's going to be, um, what can I say, very interesting. Um, of course, I'm going to be interested to see everything that they're doing and have done and so on. Um, it's it's different, of course. I'm I'm just uh, I'm I'm sure I'm going to be uh, emotionally engaged. What shall I say? Yeah, <laughs> of course. I mean, the last thing, Freddie. If you would have to name five words which would describe this journey over almost 60 years now. What would these five words be for you? Well, just one word. I'll say worthwhile. Super cool. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. That was a very nice ending. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening and please stay tuned for the next episode of the Synergia People podcast 2023.